everyone. Welcome to Weather Extra. I'm meteorologist Jillian Johnson. We have a packed show for you this week, so let's dive right into this week's top weather stories from across the United States. The United States had a busy week of severe weather last week, a true sign of severe weather season unfolding as we head into the new season of spring. A multi-day severe weather outbreak occurred, bringing all modes of severe weather across parts of the nation. On Wednesday, March 13th, the severe weather outbreak of the week began with two strong EF2 tornadoes striking rural parts of Kansas. Thankfully, no fatalities or injuries were reported, but the twisters did cause damage to multiple homes and outbuildings. Along with the tornadoes, there were multiple reports of large hail smashing through parts of Kansas and Missouri as well. The following day on Thursday, the 14th, additional severe storms tore through the south and midwest. A large and deadly EF3 tornado impacted the community of Indian Lake in western Ohio. Three people were killed and 20 others injured as widespread damage was reported across the town. Another intense tornado was reported in Indiana on Thursday, injuring nearly 40 people. That twister also raided an EF3 and was on the ground for more than 25 miles, with wind speeds up to 165 miles per hour. There were also multiple severe storms that tore through the Lone Star State this past week, with large hail being the main hazard in our rounds of severe weather. Here's a video of large hail falling in North Texas from this past Thursday. And while severe storms were tearing through the south and midwest, a dangerous snowstorm was dumping historic amounts of snow across Colorado. Thousands of flights were canceled and local residents were urged to stay off the roads as travel became impossible due to the feet of snow that accumulated. Well, we are now entering our severe weather season here in Central Texas, and one way we keep you updated on our severe weather potential is by using the severe weather outlooks that are issued by the Storm Prediction Center. For more on what those outlooks are and why we use them, here's meteorologist Sean Bellafuri. Especially during severe storm season, you may notice this map that we share on KWTX.com, on air, and on, of course, our free KWTX weather app. This is the severe storm risk outlook. It's a five-point scale going from low to high to try to show where the best potential for severe thunderstorms is. This map is created by the spectacular scientists up at the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. Not only do they make that severe weather risk outlook map, but they also provide the watches across the entire country whenever severe thunderstorms or tornadoes are expected. If you're a weather nerd, this is a fantastic site to go to spc.noaa.gov. They have lots of forecast tools, research tools, tornado environment browsers. You could really sink your teeth into this, but back to the severe weather risk outlook map. It is a five point scale from one to five to try to show where the best severe storm risk is, but it's a probabilistic outlook. So what does that mean? Well, if we were to drop you into San Antonio in a 25 mile radius around you, you would have a level three severe weather risk. Now that translates to a specific probability depending on the type of severe weather that could happen and how high that chance is of seeing severe thunderstorms. So in this instance that I just showed you, it's the enhanced category that level three because there is a 30% chance of seeing severe weather. Now, whenever we talk about severe weather, we're talking about wind gusts of at least 58 miles per hour, hail of at least one inch in diameter or a tornado. But sometimes, especially during the heart of severe weather season, we could get significant severe weather, which is kind of the next step up. That would be for wind gusts of at least 75 miles per hour, hail at least two inches in diameter or a tornado of at least EF2 rating and is noted on the risk outlook map by the lined area that you would see. So what is the severe weather risk outlook map for? It's a way to convey, of course, what the best storm potential is. Central Texas frequently under a level one severe weather risk, meaning some storms are capable of damaging winds, severe hail, maybe even a brief tornado. And these storms are similar to what you would experience several times per year. But if we go down to the bottom of the scale, the high category level five, that is high confidence that an outbreak of storms will contain tornadoes, damaging winds and severe hail. This is a very intense weather setup. Those storms may only occur once or twice in your lifetime. Reporting in the studio, Sean Bellafuri, KWTX News 10. 
Thanks, Sean. With severe weather season arriving in Central Texas, that means the spring is right around the corner. The spring equinox, or the start to spring, is just two days away, starting this Tuesday, March 19th. The new season officially starts at 10.06 p.m., the exact moment when the sun sits directly over the Earth's equator. This is also the day where the length of night and day are nearly equal across the globe. Now, another thing that happens this time of the year is the start of daylight saving time, which officially began one week ago. It's the time of the year where we lost an hour of sleep but gained an extra hour of daylight. Now the sunset time today, the 17th, is at 738. A week from now on the 24th, the sun will set about five minutes later at 743. Let's fast forward, fast forward a month to April 24th, where our daylight time will grow by about 20 minutes with a sunset time of 803. Let's skip forward to another month the, to June now, where our sunset time will be after 8.30. The uh, summer solstice occurs on uh, June 21st. That's the longest day of the year with over 14 hours and 12 minutes of daylight. After the 21st, our days will slowly begin to grow shorter uh, with daylight saving time coming to an end on November 30. See that 5.37 p.m. sunset time. That is the time of the year where it's time to set those clocks in our backwards. Now the time change uh, each year always brings up the conversation of why do we change the time? And here's no surprise to many. The government is still trying to figure out exactly what time it is. CBS's Scott McFarland explains. In the Rockies at a 206 acre federal government campus outside of Denver, they spend a lot of time studying the time. That's the on time tick. Inside the lab at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, scientist Andrew Novick and the federal government's Time and Frequency Division are perfecting their atomic clock. We deal in nanoseconds here. Those are billionths of seconds. Who would care about that? Something like your phone, GPS. GPS works by having atomic clocks on board satellites, sending signals to you and I and everywhere, and that's how you get your location. Because no matter how large or how sharp they appear, clocks aren't perfect, and eventually they slip over time with consequences. Yeah, imagine something like the stock market, right? You have hundreds of millions of transactions happening in a second. So you have to time tag those. Who, who bought it first? There's so much slippage and imperfections in our measure of time. Every few years, the global community has to add a leap second to catch up. You just add a second to one day to yeah. keep everything aligned. Yeah. It's mind boggling. It's pretty wild. <laughs> government is frequently grappling with time. It was the government that created the time zones about 100 years ago to help trains and transit systems keep uniform time and prevent mishaps on the tracks. Here in Congress, they're even debating changing the time. A new proposal would make daylight saving time permanent and end the twice a year clock changing. We like that extra hour. You got to remember, we're a rural state. Farmers love daylight savings and a lot of other things too. Kids practicing baseball. A similar proposal nearly passed into law in 2022. So Alabama's Tommy Tuberville is trying again, though there's been opposition from those worried about the impact of especially late morning darkness. You get a lot of calls about this. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's the number one issue. We're going to leave it daylight savings time. Meanwhile, back in the federal lab in the mountains, they're still testing and measuring ways to better count those nanoseconds, trying to perfect all the time in the world. Scott McFarland, CBS News, Boulder, Colorado. Coming up next on Weather Extra, the total solar eclipse is just a few weeks away. We'll have more on everything you need to know about this once-in-a-lifetime event after the break. Well, we are just 22 days away from the total solar eclipse passing right through Central Texas. News 10's Isabella Quintanilla spoke with one local couple who has traveled the world to witness this special phenomenon. Get ready to meet Gail Peak and Dean Chandler, who, you, who are what you might call eclipse chasers. Here's Isabella with their story. Total solar eclipses are extremely humbling. Each one is different for different reasons, but they're always wonderful and they remind you that you're just a piece of the puzzle. Together, Peak and Chandler have seen five total solar eclipses in four different continents, including the U.S., South America, Africa, and Russia. Well, the first one was off a cruise ship, in a cruise ship off of uh, Curacao. Then uh, uh, 
uh, Novo Sibirsk in, in Siberia, a public park, uh, and, and a dairy farm in Zambia, just to name a few, and a mountain in Chile just recently. And well, of course, we saw the one in uh, St. Louis. The first eclipse they saw together was in 1998 and their most recent one in 2019. But for the first time, they'll be watching a total solar eclipse from their front yard. The unique thing about Central Texas is we're in the path of totality. I mean, that's where you have the best viewing of the eclipse. Because they've witnessed it so many times, they know the unique things that happen during an eclipse that most people watching for the first time might miss. And when it's dark where you are, it's going to be light everywhere else because the shadow isn't big enough to go all the way to the horizon in any direction. And you will see it darken first at the southwest, and then it'll darken over you, and then it'll lighten up in the southwest, but it'll darken over the northeast. So you can see the shadow actually moving. But no matter how many times they see an eclipse and how many different countries, they say they'll never tire of it. There's no greater gift than just looking up and being enticed and mesmerized by what's out there. Thanks, Isabez. Isabella, we continue our eclipse coverage, and in this week's Degrees of Science, Brady Taylor had the chance to speak with Dr. Barbara Endel, an assistant professor of physics at Baylor University. In their conversation, they cover everything you need to know about this once-in-a-lifetime event. Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. We're getting closer and closer to the big April 8th total solar eclipse, and we're going to talk in a little more detail about it with our resident eclipse expert. We got Dr. Barbara Endo from uh, Baylor University. So uh, gearing up, getting closer to it. For folks that may not know, what's some of the kind of the nuts and bolts that kind of go together to cause a total solar eclipse? Well, thank you very much for having me again here. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, so the moon orbits around our planet Earth and the, the Earth and the moon orbit ar around the sun. If those orbits were perfectly aligned, we would see eclipses every month. It is an amazing coincidence that the angular size of the moon is exactly the same as the angular size of the sun, as viewed from our planet. In other planets, that's completely different because the, the ratio between the sizes and the distances is completely different. But we are in a very special location. So if, if these orbits were perfectly aligned, we would see eclipses every month. Every new moon, we would see a total solar eclipse. Every full moon, we would see a total lunar eclipse. But there is a five degree inclination angle that makes eclipses so special for us. We had an eclipse back in October, but it was an annual eclipse. How, how can we have different style eclipses with it's the same moon moving in front of the sun? That's an excellent question. So when Kepler tried to fit the data from the planetary orbits, uh, he actually realized that the orbits are not circles. They are actually ellipses. And this is true for every single object around the sun and for most of the moons around the planets. They are nearly circular orbits, but they are not circles. They are just a little elongated ellipses. So th in the particular eclipse that we had in October, the moon was just a little bit further away. So when the moon passed in front of the sun, it didn't fully cover the disk of the sun, causing the annular eclipse. On the day of the eclipse, as the sun's gradually, or the moon's moving in front of the sun, what kind of changes will people see uh, going on as that starts to occur? So it's gonna get darker, it's gonna get colder, I think that's the biggest changes that we're going to observe. Uh, bring a jacket if you're going to be outside. I know it's April, everybody is already feeling warm and the spring coming in, but yes, it will get colder. It's surprising how much uh, the amount of, of sunlight will be diminished. Wow, that's, that's amazing to be that much cooler. So for someone that say lives in an area where it's partial compared to in totality, how much of a difference is the view from those two locations? Well, it's literally night and day. So uh, whenever we have the totality, it will get dark. It will get dark, dark. We will be able to see not only the most amazing things, which are the corona of the sun and the, the diamond ring and the 360 degrees uh, sunset, but we're also gonna be able to see stars, planets. It's, it's just beautiful. To me, I think it's one of, it, it is the most, beautiful natural phenomena that, that I have ever seen in my life. That four minutes when that eclipse is going on, how, I mean, how much would you recommend everybody that humanly can get outside to be outside during to see yes. that? Yes, I was happy to see lots of uh, districts have canceled mm. classes for the day. Uh, this is 
this is perfect because the kids will have the opportunity to fully experience that with their families. Um, it is a misconception to say that something bad is going to happen during the eclipse. It's not dangerous, it's not harmful for you, there's nothing, no changes in the amount of radiation that comes from the sun or any, I mean, it comes less, obviously, but it is not different than a normal sunset. So nobody should be scared. It's a beautiful, amazing natural phenomenon. We should all be super excited about it. <laughs> Go outside, enjoy the eclipse, and don't forget your glasses. Yes, <laughs> and there's no substitute for this, okay? I heard of people saying, oh, I can put on 10 sunglasses. Yeah. No, please don't do that. Yeah. The damage of the sun is permanent in your eyes, and there is no, no way to recover is from Is there that. a limit of how long you should look through these at the sun, or is it pretty much safe no, if you it, want to do it? No, it is safe, yes. Okay. If you have the proper ones, it's okay. To hear more about the total solar eclipse, scan the QR code on your screen to watch on YouTube or go to kdbtx.com slash degrees of science. Weather Extra will be right back. Welcome back to Weather Extra. The world is inching dangerously close to a critical climate change threshold. A new report is confirming what we already knew. 2023 was the hottest year on record, and now our planet has also just experienced its hottest February ever. CNN meteorologist Chad Myers has the details. According to the very latest press release from Copernicus Climate Change Service, February of 2024 globally was the warmest February on record, and really to no surprise. It was 1.77 degrees C above pre-industrial levels. And in fact, there were some days at the beginning of February that were more than two degrees C above normal globally. Again, we're talking land and sea and all that. And look at this. This is the warmest sea surface temperatures we have ever experienced here. Look how big of a gap that is too. It's a 0.2 degrees higher than any time we've ever seen that we've been measuring ocean surface temperatures. Something that's disturbing for the Atlantic hurricane season is this big red area here. The warmest on record for this time of year for that eastern part of the Atlantic. It is so warm that there was a very rare tropical system that moved into Brazil over their summertime, of course, but still very rare for that to happen. Moving farther on down to the south, because we know it was the southern hemisphere summer, we did have a near record for Antarctic sea ice, a near record low, but not quite, still about the third lowest, but look how close that was to the bottom of this scale. So not much ice down there either. And now with sunshine, the northern hemisphere is starting to heat up as well. As Chad Myers just reported, Earth just experienced the warmest February on record. And according to NOAA, the entire winter season was the warmest on record for the United States, dating back to the late 1800s. In fact, winter has become the fastest warming season for nearly 75% of the country. December was a full seven degrees above average. Aside from a brutal cold spell across the nation in January, higher temperatures continued through the season. February finished as the third warmest on record for the U.S. And natural disasters forced nearly 2.5 million Americans from their homes in 2023. That's according to estimates from a new Census Bureau survey released earlier this month. The survey provides important context for a year that brought a record number of billion dollar weather disasters. There were 28 such disasters last year, far surpassing the previous high of 22 in 2020. Florida and three other states, Texas, California and Louisiana, accounted for nearly half of all those who lost their homes in 2023. And global carbon pollution reached a record high in 2023. The International Energy Agency says emissions grew by 1.1% last year to 37.4 billion metric tons. Pollution from coal accounted for more than 65% of the increase. Many countries had to rely on fossil fuels because extreme droughts restricted hydropower production. Still, the agency says there was a surge in clean energy last year, but the world is still significantly off track if it wants to restrict global heating. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Weather Extra. As technology continues to advance, there's been a ton of new discoveries and images coming from outer space. Here are some of the latest headlines you need to know. 
Back towards the end of February, NASA says the sun emitted two strong solar flares, and the agency's Solar Dynamics Observatory was able to capture these images you see now. They caught these solar flares by using extreme ultraviolet light to make the flares visible to us. And take a look at this. Australian astronomers have discovered what may be the brightest object in our universe. It's a quasar located 12 billion light years away, and astronomers say it's over 500 trillion times more luminous than the sun. Quasars are powered by massive black holes and have been around since the early days of the universe. It's believed that the black hole at the heart of this quasar has a mass of 17 billion suns. And the first images from a powerful new space telescope from Europe have been revealed. The European Space Agency launched the Euclid Telescope back in July. Its mission is to create the most detailed 3D map of the dark side of the universe over the next six years. These initial observations were captured from the telescope's orbital home one million miles from Earth. The images include colorful views of a stellar nursery and massive clusters of galaxies and stars from millions and billions of light years away, many of which had never been seen. There's also been a new study published in the journal Nature Communications that found Mars could be driving giant whirlpools that can reach the bottom of the Earth's deep oceans. The authors say the currents or eddies can erode the seafloor and cause large accumulations of sediments. Scientists analyzed the sediments drilled from hundreds of deep sea sites over the past half century to look back tens of millions of years into Earth's past. The study said the cycles are linked to the interactions of Mars and Earth orbiting the sun and translates to periods of increased solar energy. That's all we have for you on this episode of Weather Extra. We'll see you again next weekend for another half hour of nothing but weather and science. Have a great week.